Merci, Sarah. Um, yes, so what comes after the nation state? Huh? Um, first of all, I assume that's a relevant question because I assume the nation state is going away. Yeah? Not everyone assumes that. Huh? But if we look in at history, nation states are actually quite new. They only existed for about 400 years uh, since the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. Huh? And they haven't proven to work that well, actually. It's the source of a lot of conflicts over territory and governance models. And now, uh, with technology, obviously, uh, we're so interconnected all over the world, uh, through, also through global trade, global transportation, etc. And we're also much more local, in a way, um, because there are a lot of, um, as opposed to during the industrial age, when it was quite centralized, one big employer that employed many, you know, uh, tens of thousands of people. Now people are more actually living in smaller and smaller communities, global nomads uh, in their neighborhood, in cities, etc. So it's a natural progression. But the question is that we have to ask ourselves is what comes after, right? How do we make this transition good? So in my opinion, we have two options. Huh? So here, and I'm gonna take, ironically, nation states, two nation states, huh? as an example to illustrate these two options. Huh? So, uh, so this is a tale of two societies. Huh? They are quite similar in many ways. Huh? They are both mountainous, they are both landlocked. Huh? Um, they both have many different cultures, uh, languages, ethnicities, tribes, Etc. Um, can you guess which two nations these are? All right, I'll come to that a little bit later. <laughs> nice cliffhanger, right? Um, but they are also very different. Huh? Even though they have similar preconditions, the result is uh, radically different. Huh? So one is uh, Switzerland. Huh? one of the world's most prosperous countries on earth. Huh? Um, they have one of the highest uh, GDP in the world, highest living standards, highest level of education, etc., etc. The other one is Afghanistan. It's the fourth poorest country on earth, uh, one of the countries in the world with the highest illiteracy rate, uh, child mortality rate, um, uh, lowest life expectations in the world, etc. Uh, Switzerland has been at peace for, it's the longest, the country in, in the world who has been at peace for the longest time. Afghanistan have been in perpetual war for nearly 40 years now. So what makes them different? So if you look at Afghanistan, before uh, the Soviet ca came in, when it was uh, the king ruling the Shah, he was basically just governing Kabul, while the rest of Afghanistan was very much self-governing. In Switzerland, and then when the Soviets came in, uh, they tried to impose a one-for-all communist government, right? And then after that, the Mujahideen, the Taliban, and now the Western occupation. In Switzerland, uh, which is actually, which was ironically created during the Treaty of Westphalia, um, because everyone else around them became nation states, so they kind of had to as well, right? But it was really quite unnatural. So instead, they decided to have uh, super decentralization. So basically, each canton have their own laws, um, their own government. It's very much um, a federate uh, <clears throat> kind of model, right? It's, uh, yeah, very autonomous. So I think this is a good example to illustrate that when we try to impose a one-fit-all model, things are not going to work. And when we try to, um, when we let, you know, people govern themselves huh, to a greater degree, we achieve much better peace and prosperity. So basically, what the way we're going now is that we're giving more and more power in the hands of institutions like UN, NATO, the European Union, and so forth, which is only, as in a post-nation state perspective, going to lead to greater centralization, right? 
um, and I think will create an eternal Afghanistan. So instead, we are trying to build an eternal Switzerland through giving power back to people to create their own jurisdictions, basically, their own nations. Um, <clears throat> I really love uh, Nassim Taleb. Um, so here is one of his quotes about um, sending uh, State Department officials to pottery courses, paid pottery courses. <laughs> um, so I used to work for, as a contractor, God forgive me, for um, the US government mainly in war zones for seven years. And that was exactly my experience of it. And basically, all these people from Brussels, from State Department, from the UN, etc., um, they do much more harm than good, not because of some global evil conspiracy or bad intentions, not at all. They're actually extraordinarily well-intentioned. But it's this thinking of, we know, we know what everyone else needs and we can impose our model on them, whether they want it or not. That is extremely dangerous sort of thinking. So therefore, um, to kind of get out of this and provide a better alternative, a decentralized alternative, we're building Pangea, which is our decentralized digital jurisdiction powered by the blockchain. Why a jurisdiction? Because uh, <clears throat> if you look at government, if you really break it down to what a government does, it's basically security and um, dispute resolution, right? Protecting people, people's assets, people's physical self, everything, right? Uh, that is much more important than anything else in healthcare or education or what have you. Those are the core fundamental functions of a government. And now it's more and more becoming security and jurisdiction is becoming the same thing, right? Because more and more facets are becoming increasingly digital. Um, so in order to do that, in order to be resilient, we have created a quantum resistant mesh network as the back end so that uh, even if a nation state, for instance, or a hacker or whatever, would shut down internet in an area, people can still use it uh, and even you know it's even secure against emerging threats like quantum computing etc to to create extreme resilience um, we're currently implementing the ethereum blockchain because it's currently the most versatile one for smart contracts uh, but it's ultimately blockchain agnostic uh, so we're planning to integrate bitcoin through the rootstock protocol and other blockchains in the future, maybe EOS, Tezos, etc., whichever ones emerge as the best ones. Um, but the front end is a chat interface, which is very intuitive. So even people in low literacy areas, for instance, can use it through emoticons. And um, it's, it is statistically the way people are more and more doing business through applications like WhatsApp, uh, WeChat, etc. So basically what our software does, it allows you to make agreements, resolve disputes, um, and create your own nations. So for instance, if you create a nation, you could choose uh, if you want a democracy, autocracy, theocracy, whichever other governance model, um, in our case, holacracy. Uh, you could choose if you want a capitalist economy, a communist economy, uh, or any other um, econ economic form, or none at all. Um, you could choose whether you want common law, or Sharia law, or civil code, whatever legal code you want, to, uh, whatever, code, whatever code of law you want, and you could also um, choose any other parameters, like how citizen can enter or leave, uh, what the constitution is like, how the constitution is governed, what services you have, for instance, uh, do you add basic income to it as an application, do you add peer to peer um, security, do you add healthcare insurance, for instance. All of those things are optionable and everyone can create their own option, right? And it can be physical, for a physical community, or it can be virtual for a virtual community, whichever. And right now, so uh, we're doing a token sale event 
fairly soon. And when, during that event, huh, we're going to launch a bunch of nations, actually. Uh, so a lot of people have signed up already, and there are some extraordinary ideas. Huh? So, for instance, there is a group of people who want to create something called E-Venezuela, inspired by uh, the Estonian e-residency program for basically people who are unhappy with Venezuela, which quite a few are at the moment. <laughs> um, there is a nation called Seed Love, uh, for basically people who grow different crops and need like crop insurance um, in case like something doesn't work out one year, then they can share crops, etc. Like a global network of crops. Um, and uh, there is also one person who is a stateless refugee who want to create a nation offering governance services to those who are stateless in the world. And that is the beauty of it, right? We are not saying that our model is best, um, <clears throat> not to mention any name or offend anyone, but that's, that's kind of what uh, a lot of people are doing today, saying, oh, we need global democracy or we need uh, global this, global that. We are saying we don't need anything, really. What we need is people to be able to decide for themselves how they want to live their lives, right? So, um, so basically, with our system, with where we are building, we can do that. Huh? Basically, we are trying to create a global Switzerland. We want to let our thousand nations bloom through our Pangea jurisdiction and the power of blockchain. Yep, that's it.